Welcome. I have the pleasure of introducing um, this evening Megan Skiba, uh, Dr. Skiba, and she will be talking about the essential nutrients for healthy aging. I am Kathy Insel. I'm the director of the, the privileged director of the Innovations in Healthy Aging um, at Strategic Initiative here at the University of Arizona. I want to thank you for joining us, and I'd like to give you a very brief overview of our initiative since I know you're here to hear Dr. Skiba. Some fast facts about aging. By 2030, and I know you've heard this before, but we're talking seven, six years really, one in six people worldwide will be aged 60 years and over. Between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population over 60 years of age will nearly double from 12 to 22 percent. And interestingly, the number of workers 65 and older has increased 117 percent in a span of the last 20 years, according to U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I can tell you I'm one of them. I have a personal interest in this initiative. So the goals of the Innovations in Healthy Aging were to create an age-friendly University of Arizona that welcomes older adults and supports healthy aging. It's one of the reasons we are trying to bring people into the campus. This is your campus, your university, and we are part of the community. We also wanted to partner with developers of senior living communities and aging industry experts. We sought to expand our capacity in research and discovery that is focused on aging. And we wanted to increase the workforce to meet both the opportunities and challenges of our aging population. I also have the distinct pleasure of working with some remarkable women on this initiative. Um, to my left on the, on the picture is Dr. Mindy Fain. She's seated in the front row. Dr. Fain is the co-director of the Arizona Center on Aging and an expert in all things geriatrics and palliative care, an incredible supportive person to be working with. On my right in that view is Dr. Esther Sternberg. She's one of the other co-directors of this initiative. Esther is um, an expert in healing environments and as they apply to aging has become more familiar with that impact. And I am grateful for both of these ladies, but I also want to call attention to Anissa Westcott, who runs the day-to-day -day workings of this initiative. And without her, we would not be in very good shape. So I really am grateful to you. And Denitza, can you please also be acknowledged here? Thank you for all your support and for, uh, and for putting these lectures together. I also want to thank Dr. Michael Dake. He's the SVP of the University of Arizona Health Sciences. He's the co-creator of the initiative. And at the beginning, I want to thank him for having the inspiration and the view that this was central to our university, and also for his continuous support. And I want to thank the Office of Strategic Initiatives, and in particular, Jane Hunter, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. <clears throat> I want to give you a little heads up um, Innovations in Healthy Aging Lecture Series continues next month on October 4th with um, Dr. Robbie Britton. Um, she will be talking about vibr vibrant brains that last a lifetime. Um, and this will take place also in the Health Sciences Innovation Building and also virtually. Now, Dr. Um, Megan Skiba, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing. She is an assistant professor in the College of Nursing in Advanced Nursing Practice and Science Division at the University of Arizona. She received her doctorate in Health Behavior and Health Promotion from the Mel and Nina Zuckerman College of Public Health, and additionally has formal graduate training in Epidemiology and Nutritional Sciences. She completed a postdoctoral training at Oregon Health Science, um, Health Science University, Oregon Health Sciences University, I guess it's, it's OHSU, so that's right. Prior to that, she practiced clinically as a registered um, nurse, or registered dietitian, I'm always thinking nursing, I'm sorry, Megan, at Canyon Ranch. 
Dr. Skiba has experience delivering remote diet and physical activity interventions, health coaching, accelerometry, mixed methods, and data analysis. Her research has an emphasis on biological aging, technology, and diets. Megan, welcome. Here we go. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening here in person in this beautiful space and those online joining us from the comfort of your home, the park, wherever you may find yourself. Today I'm here to talk about the essential nutrients of aging. And what I'm going to do is we're going to I'm going to provide six essential nutrients of aging and this is going to be a spin off of essential the six essential nutrients of our life. Essential nutrients are ones that cannot be synthesized or our body cannot create them and therefore we must get them from the foods that we eat. They're, they're essential for our body's normal functioning. These are water, vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So today we're going to go through, I'm going to go through each of these essential nutrients for healthy aging with a background on the recommendation, some of the science supporting it as it relates to healthy aging, and then just some general tips for integrating it into your daily life. Just to begin, I have to do the disclaimer just to let you know as a registered dietitian nutritionist, um, I am providing general um, information and advice, but this is not intended to replace the personalized medical or nutrition advice that you, advice that you might receive from your healthcare professional. Um, I would recommend if you have any healthcare concerns that you consult one of these professionals, specifically a registered dietitian nutritionist who can counsel you and make recommendations. They can take out your, they'll look at your current health, your current medications, and they'll be able to align a plan uh, for you with your personal goals. I also have no conflicts of interest, it's close. So Dr. Insel gave a quick background on this as well, but I'm just gonna reiterate it, that we are faced with a rapidly growing aging population. By 2030, that's seven years from now, uh, it's projected that one in five adults will be aged 65 or greater. By 2060, 37 years from now, that'll be one in four. So you can see here, by the mid-2030s, it's actually projected that for the first time we'll have more adults over the age of 65 than we will have children under the age of 18 living in the United States. So we start to have a demographic shift that looks something like this, where in the 1960s we were a pillar with a larger population younger and a smaller uh, amount of the population aging. Now we're going to be in a column kind of distribution where we're going to have just as many adults who are older as we are younger adults. The chronic disease burden among older adults is also projected to continue to climb. So within this time frame, it's projected that over 221 million adults who are aged 50 years and older, sorry for the different cut point, <laughs> uh, will have a chronic disease in the United States. When we start to look at comorbid conditions or more than one, that number is 14 million adults. Now looking at the picture on where we are now, we have this graph. This is from the CDC and it's the, like, the crude or just a basic estimate of how many adults in the United States are living with a chronic condition, one or more. And so over the last decade, we see that it's been holding pretty steady at around 70% for both females and males. These chronic conditions can include things such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, uh, COPD, and Alzheimer's disease. We're also seeing a trend that's complementary in a not satisfying way of decreasing dietary quality among older American adults. And this graph is showing dietary quality um, in adults age 65 or older in the United States using a study called the National Health um, and Nutrition Examination Survey. So they looked over time from 2001 to 2018 to look at dietary quality. What is dietary quality? They did it using a dietary score that was aligned with the American Heart Association recommendations for preventing cardiovascular disease that included components like uh, fiber, protein, all these kind of things. So they looked at the score, and what they found is that over time, um, in a, adults age 65 or greater, um, the proportion of older adults with poor dietary quality, that's our green line, has increased 10% over this time period. We also see that the intermediate dietary quality, where they're, they're doing okay, they could do better, also decreased 10% in the last 10 years. 
that's our orange line. Now at the bottom we have our cyan line. That's those who have the ideal dietary quality. And it's been steady at nearly 0%. Now, when they looked at the individual dietary components to identify what might be driving this trend, it was found that it could be related to a decrease in the consumption of total fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, and legumes, as well as increases in processed meats, sugar-sweetened beverages, and saturated fat. So where we find ourselves now is at this crucial pivot point. We're finding ourselves at the intersection of aging-related chronic diseases and nutrition-related chronic diseases. Unlike our age, which we unfortunately cannot modify, we do have control over modifying some parts of our diet. The challenge will remain in optimizing this for each individual, which often will mean balancing the increased nutrient demands that come with aging with the lower energy demands or calorie intake also required with aging. And this is important because there are functional consequences of aging that nutrition can help uh, buffer. And so when we look at the con functional consequences of aging, we can consider them as cognitive and physical, so body and mind, right? Cognitive can include delayed processing speed, impaired memory and language, an executive function decline, whereas physical consequences can include difficulties in engaging in our activities of daily living. These are things like per basic hygiene, showering, brushing our teeth, preparing meals, walking, going to the grocery store, or taking care of a household. They can also include decreased balance and grip strength. These are associated with falls. Um, and there can also be um, mobility loss as a consequence of aging. The last one as well is frailty and sarcopenia. This is a condition that's marked by loss in muscle mass. Now, these are some projected trajectories on how aging can look for individuals. While there are only three shown here, technically anyone could fall anywhere within these spans of these trajectories. But looking at this graph, on our x-axis, the bottom, we have a age, and on our y-axis is an um, increasing burden of chronic disease or onset of chronic disease. The different age trajectories are depicted as the different colored lines with different slopes uh, that are correlated to the rate of the response to an accelerated or a successful aging trajectory. So you'll see there at the very top a solid black line. This is considered the threshold for an aging-related disease onset. And that when you're seeing that those who are experiencing accelerating aging, that red trajectory, they're meeting that line faster, sometimes 20, 30, 50 years sooner than someone who might be experiencing successful aging. And below that at our dotted line is when we start to see initial clinical symptoms. But there's also an iceberg metaphor that I didn't picture here that is associated with aging trajectories, and that, that there is a hidden part below the surface that we cannot see. Um, and this is a long incubation period for many of these chronic conditions that don't have any clinical signs, but we might be able to detect them molecularly before they present in the clinic. And so some of these molecular markers are known as the hallmarks of aging. So in this circle here, you'll see the total 12 hallmarks of aging that have been identified to date. These have all been associated with functional consequences of aging, and have also been showed. Um, and so some of the ones that I'm just going to point out that are um, most famous, and that will kind of come up throughout this talk, are chronic inflammation, dysbiosis, telomere length, and mitochondrial dysfunction. But the thing I want to point out here is that there's been evidence that shows that dietary quality and nutrient intake can impact every single one of these hallmarks of aging, and that impact can be swayed to the positive or to the negative, depending on what those nutrients are. So I want to start with, this just came out in the news, uh, published about a month ago. This is the Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurogenerative Delay. It's the MIND diet. So these results from a randomized clinical trial were recently published, and we'll get to those in just a moment, but I wanted to give you the background of this um, this diet. So besides coming up with a great acronym and a fantastic name, it began in 2015 with researchers at Rush University. They conducted um, a study using a cohort of almost a thousand individuals, and they uh, followed them for um, a period of time, and they created a dietary pattern score. This a proprietary dietary score they made up looking at the existing literature to see which dietary components had neuroprotective effects. Um, then uh, I'll describe what those components were in, in just a moment. So these, uh, this dietary score that was developed 
I want to point out is very similar to the American Heart Association one that I showed at that graph earlier. It's very similar to um, the Mediterranean diet, to the DASH diet itself, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension or systolic hypertension, uh, as well as other dietary quality indexes like the Healthy Eating Index. They all are very similar. They're all capturing more or less the same thing. Now, with this study, they looked at some domains of cognition, including episodic memory, perceptual organization, working memory, and they also looked at general cognitive function in this cohort. And just a side note, this was, um, these individuals were on average 87 years old, 75% female, and 98.5% non-Hispanic. But what they found was that adherence to this mind diet score that they created was found to be associated with better cognitive function. And over time, they found that there was a significant difference in the rates of cognitive decline from those who had the highest adherence to the lowest adherence to the mind diet. So what you're looking here is the years over time, so over 10 years of follow-up on the study. The dashed line on the top are those in the um, group who had the highest dietary scores by the MIND diet, and the black line is gonna be those who had the lowest MIND dietary score. And what they found in this trajectory of cognitive, global cognitive function was a difference equivalent to 7.5 years in age. So this study, these findings were then duplicated in, a, uh, in the cohort, the same cohort, using post-mortem analyses. So they did autopsies of the brains and looked at um, the disease pathology of the brain, as well as cognitive function before death in this cohort. And again, the MIND diet was associated with better cognition and slower decline, uh, but it was not associated with any disease pathology. This was then again confirmed in two more cohort studies, which found associations with the dietary um, adherence and greater cognitive function. So this is what the MIND diet looks like. And their next step was to lead them to conduct a cl randomized clinical trial to confirm these important findings. So these were the dietary components that were built up in the score. To build a clinical trial, instead of these being the scoring components where you'd get a one or a zero if your diet looked like that, these became the goals for the individuals who would be randomized to this intervention to try and attain over a period of time. Um, and I will just point out that they kind of highlighted it in foods to eat and foods to limit. The foods to eat included green leafy vegetables, nuts, berries, whole grains, fish, poultry, and extra virgin olive oil specifically. And they limited red and processed meats, butter and stick margarine, and sweets and fried food. So I'm gonna quickly minimize, hang with me for these technical bits, to bring you over to a quick video. Now a new study directly assesses the effect of a dietary intervention on cognitive function. This two-site randomized control trial enrolled 604 people who were at least 65 years old, were overweight, had suboptimal diets, and were cognitively unimpaired but had a family history of Alzheimer's dementia. Participants were assigned to follow the MIND diet, which is a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet and the dietary approaches to stop hypertension diet with mild caloric restriction, or a control diet with mild caloric restriction for three years. All participants received counseling to follow their assigned diet and support to promote weight loss. At three years, the primary outcome, the change from baseline in a global cognitive score, improved in both diet groups with no significant difference between the MIND diet and control diet groups. Secondary outcomes included the results of follow-up brain imaging in 200 patients. Volumes of white matter hyperintensities increased in both diet groups, while hippocampal and total brain volumes decreased in both groups. These outcomes were not significantly different in the two groups. Rates of adverse events were also similar in the two groups. The most common events were cardiovascular and musculoskeletal. The authors conclude that in older adults without cognitive impairment but with a family history of dementia, cognitive function did not improve more with the MIND diet than with a control diet over three years. Full trial results are available at... So, at first listen to that, that sounds like... That's pretty bad, that kind of sucks, right? But what that tells me um, clinically as a dietitian, because it was compared to a control diet, 
and that both groups improved their dietary quality, that no matter what those changes are, if you can improve your dietary quality, you're likely going to improve your cognitive health. So that, I think, is the key takeaway, and that's what we're going to break down for our essential nutrients of aging. And the first one is to add a variety of fruits and vegetables. Now, fruits and vegetables are going to be one of the largest sources in our diet where we're going to get minerals, vitamins, and dietary fiber. Now, that's foreshadowing for a future slide, but notably, fruits and vegetables provide some of the potent antioxidants, vitamin E and vitamin C. They also provide plant-based phytonutrients or phytochemicals that have been linked um, in cell and animal models to longevity. And so this is the hypothetical cellular and molecular mechanisms of the anti-aging effects of phytonutrients found in fruits and vegetables. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because really what the key point here is to take away is that there are uh, many phytochemicals demonstrate anti-inflammatory effects, and that is the primary mechanism of action in which they can promote longevity. They expand the lifespan through reducing oxidative stress, uh, suppressing that low-grade um, chronic inflammation, and as shown, there's crosstalk between um, and interactions between these different cellular and molecular levels. What that might look like for the classes of phytonutrients is that there are four primary classes that are then broken up into subclasses. And now each of these phytonutrients has been studied relatively extensively, and they could each have their own hour or two-hour seminar on how they affect disease states. But the key point is um, that we get them from foods we usually tend to eat and enjoy, and a lot of fruits and vegetables. And so I wanted to state that a diet that is um, high in fruits and vegetables or moderate in fruits and vegetables provides on average about a gram of these phytochemicals combined per day. Uh, so for example, um, the bioactive class of compounds, alkaloids, you know, we'll find those in black pepper. For organosulfur compounds, we'll find those in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts. For terpenoids, we'll find those in orange foods often, orange, yellow, red, um, that would be like carrots. And then phenolytics, uh, we'll see these in um, green tea most famously. So again, because we can get a sufficient amount of these phytonutrients from a diet with a variety of colorful fruits and vegetables, I wouldn't recommend taking any dietary supplement for an individual phytochemical or phytonutrient, but instead add these foods with the compounds daily into your diet and kind of change up what those are each day. So for example, this is one of my favorite tables. We're kind of, I'm going to leave it up for you to read as I talk, but these are uh, what I call our rainbow-hued antioxidants or our rainbow-hued uh, phytochemicals. Now, these phytochemicals have been studied uh, in the literature extensively on different disease states like cancer, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and diabetes. Um, and, but these are found in, color, in common colorful foods, and I think that's the important part to highlight here. And so uh, the recommendation that I would give to add fruits and vegetables is that even though we have an established recommendation where we're gonna aim for five a day, about two fruits or three vegetables, really the easiest way I think to do that is to take your plate, make it as colorful as possible, aim to have it about half colors as possible, and pick two colors if you can from here. So I wanna point out here in this table as well some of the most famous antioxidants you might have heard of and what foods you can find them in. In our blue and purple group, there's resveratrol. We'll find those in grapes. Uh, blueberries and other dark berries. Uh, from our green group is isothiocyanates. That's going to be like those organosulfur compounds or methane. We find those again in those cruciferous veggies, bok choy, broccoli, cabbage, delicious. Orange and yellow are beta carotene. We're going to find in carrots and around this time appropriate this season, they're in pumpkins uh, as well as sweet potatoes. In red, we have our lycopene. Uh, watermelon season's ending, tomato season's ending, but we can still enjoy them. And then I don't like, uh, we don't want to forget our tan and our white fruits and veggies. I think they're often overlooked and maybe they get a bad rap. But think foods like mushrooms, garlic, onions, and leeks will also provide beneficial phytonutrients in the, di in the diet. So, um, make sure. So, even though I said like, Fill up half your plate, if you can, with colorful fruits and vegetables. If you're interested in what these recommendations or these serving sizes look like when we're estimating dietary quality in studies or if we're recommending and writing diets clinically, this is what we consider a serving of fruits and vegetables. You'll see on one side, depending on your orientation to the screen, fruits, and on the other side, vegetables. What this might look like for a day of intake um, for meeting our five-a-day goal 
as just a general goal, would look like maybe you'll have a small fruit at breakfast, like you'll have a sliced apple on the side. And then maybe you're gonna have um, some melon with dinner because you got the last good watermelon of the season. Your lunch then might be a salad with some spinach and some bell pepper as a base, and your dinner could have a side of uh, green beans. And then I also wanted to point out that when we build our plates, we can do food combinations for synergistic bioavailability. What synergistic bioavailability means is that by consuming foods with complementary um, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients in them, we can increase the amount of phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals that our body is able to absorb. So you might notice some of these as uh, common favorite pairings of foods. And so that tells me, I think intuitively as people, we found that these not only taste good together, but we might feel a little bit better when we eat these together. So some of my favorite on here are tomato and garlic, um, yeah, lemon and green tea, milk and coffee, and salmon and broccoli. The next essential nutrient is to increase beneficial fats. So again, many of those phytonutrients, vitamins and minerals that come from our uh, fruits and vegetables that are important to our health require fat to be absorbed uh, optimally in our body. However, fat is a calorie or energy dense uh, nutrient where it provides nine calories per gram of fat. So when we're making selections of what fats to include in our diet, it is asked to be mindful and deliberate about those and when possible, increase the diet, the beneficial fats on the plate. And the one beneficial fat that I'm going to spend some time on today is one of the most well-known, and that is the omega-3 fatty acid. So if you look at these five omega-3 fatty acids here, these are their chemical structures. I always love to look at them because then it makes sense why they're called omega-3 fatty acids, because you can see the omega shape in that half ring structure. Now, these are unsaturated fats, so they have different roles in the body, and our body uses them differently than, say, saturated fats. These are common fats from animal foods, thinking like butter, but they're also um, found in plant-based fats, such as coconut oil, palm oil, um, which would be like uh, sometimes the spreadable margarine. Now, we can find omega-3s um, in foods, and we can add those to our plate as well, or into our snacks, and so, um, marine fish are probably, or they're probably famous for it, but they are the, big, the greatest source of omega-3 fatty acids we can get um, from a food source. And so these include things like um, herring, anchovies, salmon, trout, and mussels. Um, so these are some good uh, animal-based protein sources for omega-3 fatty acids. Our plant-based sources, though, they still are there. Our walnuts, flaxseed, avocados, and olives are some of the higher sources of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, greater intake of omega-3 fatty acids have been associated with lower risk for, again, many of these aging-related, nutrition-related uh, chronic diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, dementia, uh, as well as rheumatoid arthritis and age-related macular degeneration. Now, many studies have looked at high doses of omega-3 fatty acids, and we're kind of going to go into those in the next slide, um, with looking at certain ratios. So looking here, ALA, DHA and EPA are the most commonly studied omega-3s, and the doses that are studied are usually only attainable through a dietary supplement. However, dietary supplements vary as far as their composition and their quality, so I still don't always necessarily think they're the best option or generally recommend them. Uh, they may be appropriate in certain circumstances. So eating a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids is associated, again, uh, with protective effects for these chronic diseases. Now, um, the... Uh, uh, there was one study, a cross-sectional study again, for about 2,000 adults, and they didn't have dementia, they didn't have a history of stroke, and for those individuals who had higher concentrations of omega-3 fatty acids circulating in the blood, uh, they had better brain structure as measured by um, an MRI, and they had improved global cognitive function, and these were um, differences that were actually observed by the APOE genotype. So looking at our mechanisms of action on why omega-3s potentially are beneficial in healthy aging is that they could counteract age-relating loss of muscle mass and improve cognitive function uh, by reducing oxidative damage and inflammation. Uh, this image here um, shows a potential mechanism through which uh, these omega-3 fatty acids can reduce inflammation in the brain specifically, so neuroinflammation, and improve cognitive function by re uh, reducing infl inflammation and oxidative stress in the brain cells. So again, looking at our serving sizes, if we were going to keep building on our day, um, 
thinking back to our breakfast, we might add a tablespoon of peanut butter now with that apple. And for our salad uh, base with our spinach and bell peppers, we're gonna be adding in two teaspoons of some olive oil on there and maybe some vinegar for some flavor. Adding this to our salad is gonna help our body absorb um, the fat-soluble vitamins, especially vitamin E, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Uh, for dinner, we might choose to um, you know, bring peanut butter back in and make a sauce, or we might have some avocado on the side. The next essential nutrient or recommendation is going to be to select lean proteins. Because of the high energy density of uh, dietary fat, lean proteins are recommended to help achieve an energy balance for an individual. So there are many lean proteins, including from animal sources, um, but there is also plant-based vegetarian vegan options. This slide um, shows many recognizable foods here that are options. If you wanted to know the recommendation for protein in general, it's 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight for a healthy adult. Usually that it will increase in older age and some individuals, depending on what's going on for them, it could be 1.2 grams or to 1.6 grams per kilogram. Now that equates, if we're looking at someone who is 120 pounds on the lower end is 35 grams of protein a day as the minimum. So I'm gonna show you another curve. This curve might look really fam familiar to the accelerating aging curve earlier. Except for this must, um, curve is now looking at an exponential decline rather than um, an increase. And so this is a graph that's showing uh, the trajectories of muscle um, health or muscle mass throughout aging. And so we, um, it's showing that our muscle mass is not only attributed to um, the strength and how we build it later in life, but only, um, and as it relates to our muscle loss, through our activities and our diet, but also it reflects the peak that was attained in earlier life. So, so from there, dietary proteins can help us protect this muscle mass um, because they provide amino acids that are needed for the synthesis of muscle proteins. And importantly, um, absorbed amino acids have um, an effect on stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So I'm gonna start, this is, a busy slide, but we're gonna take a little bit of time here on it. And this is looking at um, proportions of amino acids in selected foods across food groups. So it's broken up from top to bottom. We're looking at animal foods, legumes, grains, nuts, vegetables, fruit, and mushrooms. And then we're looking at amino acids that are grouped as essential or non-essential. Now, essential uh, amino acids are here in the black box. There are nine of them. Very similar to the essential nutrients, these essential amino acids are ones that our body cannot make, so we have to get them through our food. And these are histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methothionine, phen phenylalanine, theranine, tryptophan, and valine. So you might also notice looking at this chart that yeah, it starts with animal foods up top. They have a higher um, you know, proportion ratio of these essential amino acids, but they're also in plant-based protein foods and surprisingly maybe foods that we don't always associate as a protein food, such as kale, mushrooms, and apples. And so what's important here is the takeaway is that we still get some of these beneficial components from foods that we don't traditionally call protein foods. Now within these essential amino acids are branch chain amino acids, or BCAAs. These are isoleucine, leucine, and valine. So many older adults may um, inadvertently experience protein malnutrition, and that can happen unintentionally due to appetite loss um, or certain medications that might have a side effect of anorexia. So therefore, we wanna prioritize these high quality lean proteins to promote healthy aging by preserving the lean muscle mass. This can help contribute to less frailty and less sarcopenia. So one of the key targets of these branched chain amino acids um, is the mTOR pathway. Now one study, it was done in pigs, found that a beneficial ratio of branched chain amino acids was two to two one of leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and that it was beneficial in moderating this mTOR pathway. Now mTOR regulates a diverse range of cellular functionings and hallmarks of aging, such as cell growth, um, autophagy, uh, senescence, and mitochondrial function. Now what this um, diagram is also showing with our arrows here on the other side, the green arrow, is that these um, amino acids can also influence our dietary protein intake by influencing our appetite. And they also provide a balance in the, um, on the red arrow on the protein synth synthesis within our body. So the conclusion for this slide is that by increase, incorporating foods that have some of these branched chain amino acids, uh, which are going to be the first four colors there, 
um, can help um, have a positive effect on aging by in working on this specific pathway. Now, complete proteins. So a complete protein is one that would provide all nine essential amino acids. So again, while that chart earlier showed animal-based protein sources will often provide all of these, there are many complete proteins that are plant-based. Um, so our top row here is those that are commonly known, um, animal-based complete proteins. Our middle row are plant-based complete proteins on their own with soy sneaking in there on the bottom. Um, but we can also do what's combination, uh, what would be combinations. So this is taking an equation and balancing each side. So we would say for one food that has five of the nine essential amino acids, another one has four of the nine essential amino acids, we want to pair those up and get a complete protein between the two of them. So common ones of complete protein pairings would be uh, brown rice and black beans, oatmeal and peanut butter, and garbanzo beans and sesame hummus. So here's our serving sizes again for uh, common proteins. Again, this is looking at um, plant and animal-based proteins on one side and then dairy-based proteins on the other. Um, dairy foods can be attributed, you know, you can use them as a protein, that's why they're on this slide. Um, now, most protein needs for that individual um, based on those calculations are met by adding two or three servings of a protein to each meal um, and then maybe having a protein with a snack. So if we're going back to our day, uh, we might now make our oatmeal with a cup of milk, uh, and we're gonna increase that amount of peanut butter to add some more protein to it. Um, we also probably, maybe we'll have a hard boiled egg on the side. Now we're coming to lunch, and this one's not pictured here, but like for an average animal protein, the serving size looks about a deck of cards. So we're gonna add to our salad, we're gonna put some chicken on it and some cheese, maybe some feta. And then we're going to dinner and our green beans are turning into a tofu stir fry. And we've had some nuts as a snack as we were making dinner. The next one is choosing whole grains. So in these images here, you'll see a lot of um, whole grains um, and whole grains still have their exterior intact on them. It hasn't been removed by a machine through processing. It could be ground, but the, ex the outside hasn't been removed. Now this is important because that outside provides a dietary fiber for our body. Now there's two different types of fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber that whole grains provide us. And both are important. Now I like to think of soluble fiber as a sponge and I like to think of insoluble fiber as a broom. And these are both the cleaning tools that help move food through our digestive system. So um, looking at dietary fiber, we have a diet, this is a graph that is looking at dietary fiber intake and all cause mortality. Now, dietary uh, patterns that are higher fiber diets have been associated with a prevention of broad range of, again, these chronic age-related conditions like um, dementia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, but also type 2 diabetes, uh, as well as chronic constipation. So this study here was looking at all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality and found that there was a 15 to 30 percent decrease in mortality risk with daily fiber intake of 25 to 29 grams. There was a slight dose response curve where you can see that it's um, our grams of fiber, again, are on our x-axis here, that it starts to increase um, at the end there, and that it um, suggested that there is a greater protective benefit with the greater increase of dietary fiber. Now, the amount that they found here, the 25 to 29 grams, is an amount that aligns with the established age-based recommendations for dietary fiber intake. Now, another meta-analysis complements this finding, by, and it suggested that each 10 gram of dietary fiber increase per day is associated with a 10% reduction in mortality risk from any cause. And so one of the potential mechanisms of action of dietary fiber and why it's protective um, and for our health as we age is through the gut microbiome. So, the gut microbiome can be influenced by physiological, social, and disease-related um, exposures um, in older people. So looking at this um, chart of an individual here, we have our dietary intake as it goes through our system and how uh, we have external factors and internal factors affecting that. So we can see that there is a progressive decline in physiological function, both physical and cognitive. Um, and we can also see that within the intestinal tract itself, there can be changes in the internal microenvironment. Um, and this can in 
turn change the nutrient intake um, from older people. So what it's saying is that the changes in our gut microbiome can change what we eat. Now, other things that shape the microbiome in older people include lifelong lifestyle choices, uh, contact with the external microenvironment, so that's like housing, social, environmental exposures, and then social network. They call this a social microbiome, but that's the other humans, pets, animals that you're exposed to. And these have reciprocal influences of age-related diseases and their treatment as well. So, therefore, pulling these together, if we can incorporate whole grains, we can work to modulate or shift our gut microbiome to a favorable balance to support our health. Because again, there is evidence suggesting that the composition of our gut microbiome can influence our cravings. So our gut microbiome might have us craving a little bit more sugar. Maybe if we start replacing the sugar with a little bit more whole grains, we're gonna start craving those whole grains. Now there are two ways we can support our microbiome, and those are through prebiotics and probiotics. I'm gonna explain the differences. You might have heard both terms. Um, so a pre, for prebiotic and probiotic, a prebiotic are the carbohydrates which are resistant to digestion and they're fermented in the colon. Uh, they're found in foods and supplements. These are our soluble and insoluble fiber types. And then there are probiotics. These are the microorganisms, the bacteria and yeast that ferment fibers in the colon. These are our microbiome, they make up our microbiome. They're found in foods that are naturally fermented like sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, yogurt, kefir, as well as supplements. Now I wanna say a food that combines both would be like a sourdough bread. Now with prebiotic and probiotics, um, both promote a healthy bio microbiome, both are found in foods and both are found in supplements. Again, I will promote foods first before supplements, especially in the prebiotics as fiber supplements like Metamucil and Benafiber have not shown to have the same protective effects in the disease processes as dietary fiber. So this is a systematic review that looked at nine randomized controlled trials of prebiotics and probiotics and aging related outcomes specifically. And they found that there was uh, three key ways in which these uh, otics, prebiotics and probiotics influence healthy aging. And that was through metabolism and cognition, specifically for glucose metabolism, um, through frailty status by improving one or more of the components um, within frailty, as well as um, inflammatory markers. So uh, looking back at to our servings, we continue to build our day. Uh, the right amount of whole grains each day will be dependent on each individual and the activity level, as our body uses the carbohydrates in these foods to fuel our body and mind. So we could add to our day, for example, a half cup of oatmeal at breakfast. I might have given that away by saying we made it with milk, but you know, it's there. Um, with, bread, with lunch, we might add two slices of sourdough bread. Uh, we might mix um, with our nuts for a snack, a little bit of popcorn, and then we might have some brown rice with our tofu stir fry. Next, we're just gonna limit processed foods. And I wanna take a moment to make a distinction of something that processed foods are different than frozen or canned foods like fruits, vegetables, beans, or fish or chicken. Now, this is because those foods are great and nutrient dense foods that are more shelf stable, they're easily accessible, and they reduce the amount of time we have to spend shopping. So they are very different from processed foods, even if they are prepackaged foods. Um, sometimes they also still provide nutrients and sometimes even more. So uh, fruits and vegetables are often frozen at the time of harvest. And so it's actually been found that they don't degrade or lose their nutrients to the same rate that we might getting a fresh um, produce from the grocery store because there hasn't been that delay related to shipping and storage. So, um, and this is also to say that the hypothetical diet that we're building won't have any desserts, or won't have any sweets, won't have any celebration. Um, but what it is saying is that it is built in intentionally um, as a dessert, or you know, maybe in this instance, it's gonna be a piece of dark chocolate because we're gonna increase our phytonutrients. Um, so the key really in limiting the processed foods is to reduce the foods that are high in fat and high in sugar, as these have what have been associated with the negative um, effects on hallmarks of aging. Now, this, uh, we're gonna walk through again the potential mechanism on which this is happening. So all cells use glucose as the primary energy source with very few exceptions. And high insulin, which is a hormone that helps us regulate glucose, um, becomes dysregulated. It can promote obesity and chronic disease. This can also result in changes in body composition that are intrinsically and interconnected with the biolo biology of aging. 
Now, again, back with our gut microbiome, the selection of certain foods can also change our gut microbiome makeup. Now, changes to this gut microbiome, together with excess uh, caloric intake or sugar intake, can alter the intestinal lining permeability or gut permeability, and that potentially can cause to infiltration of compounds outside the gut. Now, the excess of energy intake and um, permeability um, can increase to insulin resistance. And again, we have downstream disease effects like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So this is our terms for our um, sugars found in foods. So whenever you're gonna look at a recipe or you're gonna purchase something, you can turn around and look at the ingredient list on the back because many foods are gonna have natural sugars. So fruit has fructose, milk has lactose. Those end on os often. Um, but you're going to look on the list for added sugars, and these could even be natural sugars like honey or agave nectar. Uh, the threshold for added sugars per day is 9 teaspoons per men and 6 teaspoons for women. So again, uh, in adding in processed foods that might be a convenient food because, again, they save time. Sometimes it can be tedious to prepare a meal for one or two, or time is limited, it's a busy day. Um, they can definitely be part of this process. So we're just going to recommend turning over that back and looking at the label. Um, and that can help you identify the best option for you that's within your means. So the key items, um, this chart details what uh, other components there are important, but I want to focus on ones from this talk and that were your dietary fiber and your total sugars and your added sugars particularly, and then looking at the protein. The last essential nutrient is one that might potentially be the most important, and that is make eating a social event. A study of the National Health and Aging Trend Study estimated that 24% older adults, that's over 7 million, nearly 8 million um, individuals are socially isolated. The Surgeon General's recent report noted that social isolation is a contributed factor for increasing mortality among older adults. A meta-analysis also found that social isolation was associated with a 32% higher risk for all-cause mortality. So foods and meals are an ideal opportunity to increase our social connections. Those who eat socially have been found to feel happier and more satisfied with their life. They're more trusting of others, more engaged with their local communities, and have higher social support when they need it. All of these are um, protective separately in healthy aging. Another study also found that dietary quality was higher among those who, eat with, who ate with others versus eating alone. And this may be due to those social support or social networks, which again were separately found to be associated with high dietary quality. So really briefly, uh, one, of, one of the potentially most famous examples of social eating is the Blue Zones. And this was an expedition led by, led by Dan Buettner in National Geographic, where him, he and his team identified Blue Zones. Or these were individuals who were 10, uh, where the population was 10 times more likely to live to the age of 100 or older compared to the US average. And so through their process, they identified five areas with, um, that were these Blue Zones. They found that these, in, uh, these societies had highly plant-based diets that incorporated fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but social eating with meal and eating meals with others were very large components. We'll also see that in some of our dietary scores that we use in science, like the Mediterranean diet does have a social component. Um, it's really hard to measure in, in research, so that's why it's often not there. But the social eating is a way for us to connect food and culture to our nutrition, and I think that's a beautiful way to do it. So last bit of the mechanism is eating with others promotes longevity, both for men and women. So one study found that eating alone, yet living with others, was assist, associated with a 21% higher risk for mortality compared to those who eat and live with others um, together, right? So that makes sense. So if you live with others, but you don't eat with them, you have a higher mortality risk. Um, now, the inverse was found for older men who eat with others yet live alone. Now, looking again at the effects between men and women, uh, we found it again. So this diagram here is looking at some components related to dietary quality, frequency of eating with others, and mortality outcomes. And there was found to be significant positive associations between eating with others and frequency of dietary quality, as well as mental health. In turn, they found that better dietary quality was associated with less mortality risk, as well as physical functioning and general health. For women, they looked at this as well. Eating with others wasn't associated with any uh, 
of the dietary quality, physical functioning, mental health, or general health measures. However, dietary quality and physical functioning were inversely associated with mortality risk, while mental health was positively associated. So, in conclusion, it really brings that no matter how we try to score it or how we try to define it, the essential nutrients for he healthy aging are the same, and, but it's the amounts that will vary for each individual. And so a healthy eating pattern at any age includes foods that are high in vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. They include a vi variety of fruits and vegetables in colorful dark greens, reds, and orange. It includes fiber from legumes, whole grains, and more. It incorporates lean proteins and unsaturated fats and includes sharing meals with others. An unhealthy, a healthy eating pattern also limits sugar added foods and highly processed foods. So I'm gonna leave you with my favorite quote from author Michael Pollan, and that's eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And as much as I love this quote, I think it'd be made a little bit better by adding together at the end. Thank you. I think that's an Anissa question. We'll have that posted on the website by Monday. Give us a couple of days to get everything together. We'll post the recording of the video as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there's a question behind you. Kathy. Um, the economics play a big part of aging, and we, we are lucky here in Tucson to have community places that encourage healthy eating and they mm -hmm. educate others in different parts, in different neighborhoods. So I would love to see research in those neighborhoods, in those populations, and compare the research that you presented. Um, and then I think that if we improve those things, we would all be healthier. And I think that's the goal here, especially in Tucson. Thank you for this. Yes, thank you so much for mentioning that. It is an important component and one that could not fit in this time today. But there is, and it's something that um, there is a slide for, but the social resources available to help support um, food and high quality diets within our local community and national as well. Uh, we have a lot of great organizations within the university that have programming that is, is amazing, bringing it out into, as you said, our neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's one behind you or online, I don't know. Hi, thank you. Do you see any studies that show that the nutrients in fruits and vegetables have gone down over time in the last few decades because of environmental factors, soil quality, things like that? Um, I would say I don't specifically know of any study that looked at that directly. There is literature looking at um, again like that time of transit from harvest to, to plate that we can see some um, nutrients reduce. I know there is a lot of research in biotech looking at actually increasing the nutrition of certain foods. So for example, there's one for like yellow rice um, and, and other foods like that. Um, but I think that if that research is out there, it's worth reading or otherwise it's worth doing. Yeah. We have a question online. Isn't high liquid fructose intake very dangerous? So I don't know if dangerous is the term I would use for it, but fructose is one of the sugars that is not metabolized by insulin. So it can, um, too much of it in our body can, uh, it'll be metabolized in our liver and that can cause some systemic downside effects. So again, fructose from fruit is gonna be very different than that concentrated like high fructose corn syrup or other things like that. So again, just kind of selecting them in a balance, um, getting the fructose from fruit when possible. The study that talked about eating with others, uh, that was done before COVID, is that right? Let me go back and look at the date published. Yes, 
that one was published before COVID. Um, there are studies that have looked at, I'm kind of guessing your question, but there are studies that have looked at on whether or not COVID-19 changed our behaviors of eating with others. And we did find that during the active like isolation, um, you know, stay at home orders, there was a de decrease in meals with others and that increase in social isolation. Um, recent evidence is kind of saying that maybe it's picking back up. And then one study did look at it like immediately, like pre and post that start, that March 2020 start date, and looked at dietary quality and did not see changes in dietary quality, however, from that. It's also, I'm wondering if eating with others virtually would also have that same effect. I would presume so, because I think it's about that connection, it's about sharing the food. Um, you know, an online cooking class because you're also preparing the food together as a way of sharing a meal with others as well. Um, I think as a personal antidote, I remember during the like pandemic, my friends and I would have like cook-offs and we would share like in a, a group chain, like all of the food. So that was a way to try and, and connect too. So I don't think that they're, that's bad. It just, I don't think it's been studied. Thank you. You caught my attention when you mentioned vinegar added to foods to help absorption, because I fear that as you get older, your absorption possibility in your body goes down. So vinegar's not my favorite flavor. So I'm just trying to imagine what else would help. Oh. Yeah, so with that one, so adding like an olive oil would help with the absorption of the 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 vitamins there. The vinegar would be for a flavor additive. There's not so much research with the absorption. Something that you could add to your dressing though would be like a citrus base, um, orange juice, lemon juice, or lime juice, because that will also help um, actually with the plant-based iron be absorbed. Uh, for the CDC study where um, you, it reflected the intermediate uh, diet and poor diet, the rise in the poor diet, um, could was that like a survey that was sent out for their perception of their diet or was that? Okay, great question. So um, background for most of the research that was presented used something called like a food frequency questionnaire, which is a almost 200 item of like, how often do you eat the food? How much, how do you prepare it? Um, and that's the, the basis of much of the nutritional research. For the N, um, that data came from the NHANES study, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. They do a combination of like phone and mailing based food frequency questionnaires, but they also have like a mobile unit that goes out into communities, does body composition assessments. Um, we'll do like blood draws so we can look at um, like antioxidants or nutrients in the blood as well. That graph wasn't from that, it was just from um, that food frequency questionnaire. Okay, and yeah. then it was over, uh, I think, the span of 15 years. Um, did that keep the same standards for the, the food throughout those 15 years, or did the standards um, increase as well? The scoring? Uh, for like the, the scoring. Same. Yeah, so those stayed the same throughout it. Um, I will say, like, the 2018 was the most recent I could find. So, again, I don't have anything that shows potential implications from, from COVID-19 yet. We don't have that data yet. I have three. I think you have one online while she runs up there. Okay. Okay. Are smoothies just as nutritionist as eating whole fruits and veggies? Yes. That is a great way and an easy way to get in your fruits and vegetables. When you're using the smoothie and you're using that whole fruit and vegetable, you're retaining that fiber, which is really important and beneficial. And, you know, sometimes the smoothie is really refreshing and it's a nice way to get them in. I saw on the chart for um, different names for sugar, coconut was on there. Is coconut oil considered a <laughs> sugar? No, coconut oil is not considered a sugar, but coconut we can take and we can make a lot of products out of. One of them is taking the water that's within coconut and like boiling it down and we would get like a coconut sugar, a raw coconut sugar, it's like brown, um, still a sugar. Um, but you would see it like at a health food store usually. The coconut oil, it comes from pressing the flesh until you get the oil out. Um, it is a saturated fat though. If you notice, it, a saturated fat is one that is hard at room temperature. So it's just one that I would recommend in moderation. Um, it's a great, if you're gonna bake and you want a sweet, it's a good butter substitute. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. 
that's a good way that I would look at, like, so if a fat that you would be adding is solid at room temperature, it's likely a saturated fat. If it's liquid at room temperature, it's likely unsaturated with the exception if it says refined on it, they've done something to it to make it liquid at room temperature. With the, sorry, there you go. <laughs> with the video at the beginning, the mm -hmm. study with the mind um, diet, I believe, how repetitive was the cognitive testing? Um, they did it, I know for sure, every year. I don't know if they did it more frequently. I do apologize that I don't know it. I'd be happy to go back to the slide if you want to get the, the reference, we can look at it. It's okay. okay. I was just wondering if that's a potential reason for improvement in cognitive function is the repetition of the testing, um, not just the diet. Yes, that is something that can happen. It's like the learning effect within research. Usually, most studies will do a, like, um, a wash-in period where they'll have them do the test before the actual measurement for the for the study. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. I want to say it's 6.30 now, so we want to respect everyone's time. I do have one question. Actually, a couple of people have asked the same thing online, so I wanted to see if you'd address it really quickly. Um, we have questions about diabetes. Um, since the diabetes rates increase dramatically as we age, what nutrients should pre-diabetics focus on to decrease or delay type 2 diabetes? Yes. I think it would be a, it's a complementary approach between reducing the refined carbohydrates and added sugars to increasing those whole grains and those um, whole sources of carbohydrates. Again, um, that will, um, that I think is one of the more simpler ways without revamping everything. Again, depending on what's going on for that individual physiologically, a dietitian would be able to better pinpoint the exact thing, but in general, that would be the first swap, um, and then adding in vegetables if those are lower on your normal daily intake. Oh, yeah, I would swap out your um, like refined or um, high sugar carbohydrates um, for a whole grain. So that swap might look like switching from um, a piece of white bread to a whole grain. Um, bread uh, might be switching from white rice to brown rice and doing those small changes first. All right. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you need the mic? Okay.